Today's scripture reading is from Psalm 119, verses 97 to 112. If you have your Bibles, you can open them at this time or follow along on the screen. Uh, before we read, let's say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and ask that through the work of your Holy Spirit, you would give us understanding of today's passage. We ask for a blessing on Pastor Albert. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. So we start at verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. This is the word of the Lord. All throughout the summer, uh, we are working through the Psalms, and the Psalms are a collection of Hebrew poetry that express the full range of human experience and teach us truths about who God is and what God does. And so the Psalms are this beautiful part of the Bible uh, that are worth spending much time and energy in. And, and today we're continuing in Psalm 119. It's the longest of the Psalms. And in this section, it begins with these words in Psalm uh, 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. Oh, how I love your law. It's an exclamation. This is uh, a, a moment in the middle of the Psalm where the Psalmist just can't help but say it. I love your law. Now, whether you're a Christian or not, if you're not, I imagine you wouldn't have said that at all this week. If you're a Christian here, you might not have said it either. It might actually, if you think about it in your memory, when's the last time you said, even to God, I love your law? It might sound strange even as you hear it. And yet here the psalmist is saying, I love your law. I love your word. I love what you teach. I love what you show me. I love how you reveal yourself to me. I love your law. I love your word. And you might say, well, how is it that someone could come to that point where they could say that with integrity? Or how could they say that with more integrity than maybe I feel right now? And what's beautiful about this section that we're going to look at today is that the psalmist answers that very question for us. Because after making this exclamation, oh, how I love your law, he teaches us how he got there, why he can say that, how it's possible to do so. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk you through these, this section, verses 97 to 112, and look at how the psalmist describes we get to the point where we can say with him, how I love your law. And the way I hope to show you this is what the psalmist does, and that is we'll look first at how he shows that God's word first is better than, okay? That God's word is better than, that's number one. Number two, that we see God's love and his, we come to an exclamation of God's love, a uh, love for God's law and the fact that God's word is a lamp and a light, that's number two. And then third, we see a way to come to see God's love and his law as the thing we're excited about, that we have a love for his law, and that three, God's word gives life, okay? So if we want to see and understand how to come to a place where we can say, how I love your law, we see it in God's word being better than, God's word is a lamp and a light, and three, God's word gives life. All right, first, God's word is better than. Well, the psalmist tells us in basically verses 98 through 102, a whole bunch of better thans or more thans. 
And as he does that, he's showing us that God's word, his law, his word is better than so many other things. Have a look at them with me. Verse 98, he says, your commandment, another word, he uses a whole bunch of different words, commandment, precepts, testimonies. They're all slight variations on different words that describe God's law and God's word, God's instruction and God's explanation about who he is. And so he says, your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies. There's the first one. So God's word is better than because it makes us wiser than those who oppose us or who oppose God. Verse 99 and 100 describe God as the one whose word is better than and gives more understanding, he says in verse 99, than my, all my teachers, and then 100, than all the aged or the elders. And so here we have this picture. He's saying, look, if you have God's word and you study God's word and you know God's word, then you will have more understanding than even people who have taught you if they don't have God's word. And you'll have more understanding than the aged or the elders, not just in the sense that people who are older have more experience, but often people who are in this position as aged and elders have positions of authority that you will actually know more and understand more than they do, even though they have those positions if they do not have the word of God like you do. That God's word is better because it gives you more understanding. Even as your age and your experience gives you understanding and experience, they're no match for the amount of age, the amount of experience and knowledge you get when you study and are in God's word. And God's word is better also in the third way, and he describes it here in verse 103, that God's word is sweet. That God's sweet, he says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. He's basically saying God's word is more tasty, more delicious, more satisfying to my life, to my heart, and to my soul than anything else. And finally, he says in verses 101 and 102, he says, God's word is more powerful than the temptations that I face. Because in verses 101 and 102, he talks about holding his feet back from every evil way and turning aside, uh, potentially not turning aside because he has God's rules. And he's basically saying the only way I can face the temptations in life, the only way I can go through the difficulties in life, the only way I can resist going down the evil ways and not do what's wrong is to actually be immersed in God's word because God's word is better than the things I'm tempted with. That whatever it is this world offers, whatever the lies that come into our hearts and our minds say that this is what you need more than God, if you know God's word, you realize God's word is better. It's more than. Now, how do you get to a place where you can say that? How do you get to a place where you can join the psalmist in saying that you believe that God's word is what makes you wiser, more understanding, able to resist temptation, and is sweeter? How do you get there? Well, he tells us. Very practically, here are the number of things that he describes in our passage again that tell us how to actually see God's word is better. The first one is this, verses 97 and 99. He says, God's word is my meditation all the day. Verse 99, your testimonies are my meditation. Now, this word for meditation, there's different words in the Bible for meditation in the Old Testament, but this one in particular means to study something carefully and diligently. It means to take your time to not just learn about it, but to learn it deeply, to absorb it, to think about it, to, to work through it and to memorize it to such a degree that he says that when the word is something you meditate on, verse 98, it is ever with me. That whether you actually physically have God's word in your hands, like a Bible, or you have it on your phone or wherever it is that we can have it today, that you actually wouldn't even need those things because you've been so meditating on God's word that it comes to your mind. And not just on Sunday mornings, but in every day of your life, that in your workplace, in your home, in your school, wherever you are, at work, at play, wherever you are, that you meditate on God's word in such a way that it's always with you, coming to your mind, coming to your thoughts, and even coming to your lips. And the way that this is reinforced, he says, is not just by meditating on God's word, but he also says we need to keep God's word that the way for God's word to be seen and experienced as better than is to actually also keep it. And we see this in a number of different places in verse 100, 101, and 106. And he actually uses two different words for keep here. Uh, We lose this a little bit in this English translation. The first word for keep in verse 100 is the idea of observing or watching God's word. 
And again, here he's reinforcing that if you want to actually be able to understand God's word is better, you need to actually observe it. You need to watch it. You need to give your time and energy to listening to God's word, to reading God's word and letting it be the thing that's in front of your eyes, in front of your thoughts of your mind, so to speak. And as you do that, it leads to you keeping it in the other way that's described in verse 101 and also in verse 106, and that is keeping in the sense of obeying of doing what God says we ought to do. And what, in other words, sometimes it seems like people say, well, I'll obey God, but I'll just do it because I know I have to. And actually the psalmist is saying we obey God, not just because we have to, but we obey God because when you obey God, you actually see that God's way is better. That we obey him And we don't just do this out of pragmatic reasons because it works so it can get us something, but actually we realize that as we obey God, we realize God's way, God's word is better than our own way, our own word. That God in one sense, we need to recognize when we obey him and we come to recognize that God knows best. That God knows best. And then finally, he says, the way that we actually come to see that God's word is better is also to taste it. Verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And here really, I think what what, what needs to be said is the study of God's word, the meditation on God's word, the obedience to God's word has to be accompanied not just by something you do in your brain. It's not just a function of study and memorization and diligence. It's not something like studying for a test for school. It's something you're called to do. In, in delight in, to enjoy, to immerse yourself in because you realize it's sweet and it's satisfying and it's good. And that means you take the time to realize that as you read God's word, you're not just reading about facts and about stories, but you're reading about a personal God, a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God who's beautiful, a God who's glorious, a God who's good beyond any else and anything else. And so the psalmist begins by saying that he loves the law of God, he loves the word of God because he realizes God's word is better. And as you meditate on God's word, as you watch and obey God's word, as you taste and see that God's word is better, you become wiser, you grow in your understanding, and your soul is more deeply satisfied by that very better word of God that you digest, that you enjoy, and that you relish. But the psalmist says there's more. There's more than just seeing that God's word is better. He also says, point number two, that God's word is not just better than, it is also a lamp and a light. And here we move to to verse 105, one of the most famous verses in, in Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And this is very important that we understand that God's word is a lamp and a light because as the psalmist describes, we often go astray. We see this in verses 101 and 104. In 101, he says, I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. In verse 104, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every evil or false way. In other words, the psalmist realizes that we are prone as human beings to go the wrong way. And we need the lamp for our feet and the light for our path that only God's word can be. And I think in our present society, this is actually one of the most pressing things that's coming at us left, right, and center. And that is the sense that we should listen or follow a different light or a different path than God's. And the alternate path to God, the alternate way to go and live your life is not to listen even to somebody else, but the ultimate person to listen to according to our society today, especially here in Canada where we are, is to listen to yourself. That's what everybody says over and over again. And let me give you, I think, what is a very clear example of that, that you can hear and understand, I hope, clearly, not as a way to encourage you to do this, but to see how it's coming at us and how prevalent it is. Uh, This quote is from Steve Jobs, uh, the late Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple Computers. I'm using him because most of you, or many of you, have something of his design in your pocket. And he says this, Your time is limited, I quote. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma. 
which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. Do you hear it? He's basically saying the person you should listen to most, the person that you should make sure you pay most attention to is not God, not anybody else, but yourself, me. I know the way. I know what's best for me. I'm in charge. Don't tell me what to do. I shouldn't even listen to other people because they don't know best for me. This is what our world has been saying to us over the last number of decades and even more so. And this this quote is just one example of many. And the reality is, what the psalmist is trying to get through to us today is this. You don't know the way. I don't know the way. If we decide that we're gonna listen to ourselves more than anybody else, We're being foolish. And sometimes, sadly, the only way we come to realize this fact is when we follow our own path, go our own way, and we see it end up in misery, loss, and destruction. You see, the reality is it's usually not until that happens that we start to realize, I can't know the way. I don't know the way. I need someone else to show me the way. I'm not the light. I don't have the light. I have no idea where the light is. And the psalmist, I think the psalmist understands this and is fighting this because after saying your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, he's not saying it as if he's got it all figured out and he's he's got no struggles with it because As he describes this, he's basically speaking to his heart over and over again, saying, this is true. God is the lamp. His word is the lamp. His word is the light for my path. I need to remember this. Why? Well, look at the following verses. Verse 107, I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Verse 109, I hold my life in my hand continually, or my life is constantly in danger is another way to translate that, but I don't forget your law. Verse 110, the wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. He's not saying this, I don't think, triumphalistically as if he's got it all figured out. He's saying, in order for me to continue on in my life as I face affliction, as I face dangers all around me, as I face people trying to snare me, to trap me, and to ruin me, I need to realize that I can't find my own way. I got to keep looking to God. I have to keep trusting him. I have to keep saying, God is my lamp for my feet. God is my light for my path. His word is the one I need to listen to. I have to listen to him, not to other people, not to myself. I need to listen to him. That's the only way to resist turning to yourself and losing your way is to keep your eyes fixed on God's word, the lamp and the light for your feet, for your path. You and I, we cannot make it alone. And so the psalmist is saying that we need to see this in order to understand why we would love God's word because that's what God's word does. It's a light and a lamp for us. God shows us the way, but also God's word is better than all the other words that are out there. And finally, the third thing that he shows us in this passage is that God's word gives us life. That God's word gives us life. Now, how can you trust that God's word can give you the light that you need for your path, that can be the one who tells you, that God can be the one who tells you how you ought to go and where you ought to go and what you ought to do? And it's because God is the one who gives life. Verse 107 makes this really clear. It says, I'm severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Now this give me life is translating one word in the original language. And this one word is very interesting because the psalmist here, Psalm 109, the person who wrote Psalm 109, he uses this word 16 times in this psalm. 
16 times. He used it over and over again. And every time he uses it with slight variations, he basically connects life that God gives to God and to God's word. To either God's word, to his promise, to his commandment, some variation, but it's always connected. He's saying, if you want to experience life, you only get life through God's word. And his word is the one that gives life. And so the psalmist is basically making the claim that the reason you can trust God can be the lamp and the light for your world and for your way and for your path, that you can trust that God's word is better than all others is because the God of the word is the God who gives life. It's the one who gives life. And that's what leads the psalmist to say, I want to praise this God, verse 108. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. In other words, when I realize and I say to myself, God, you're the one who gives me life. You're the only one who has the power to give me life. You're the only one who has the willingness and the love to give me that life. And I get that life. And as I get that life, I respond in praise to God. I respond in giving my offerings to God and offering my life to God and saying, I want to give you everything because you have given me the one thing that no one else can give me. And that is life. A life that is not just a life here and now, but is a life that's tied again to God's word in such a way that he says in verses 111 and 112 that this word is a word that lasts forever. Verse 111, your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I incline, verse 12, 112, I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end, or translated another way, that your word is the reward of my life and your word is eternal. You see, he's saying that God, the God of the word, the God of the Bible, the God who gives us his word, who reveals himself to us, is a God who gives life and it's a life that's now and forever. But if you're listening to this right now, you might say to me, but how do I know that's true? How do I know that's not just some nice big claims that the Bible makes, that you're making, that the psalmist makes? How do I know that's true? And if the psalmist was asked this, I think the psalmist reading this entire psalm would have said, the reason you can trust that God's word is the one who gives life because God is the God who gives life. And we know God gives life because God has always kept his word and his promise. And his word is, a promise is that he would save and rescue his people. And proof is all in history. That the psalmist would look back and say, look what God has done in rescuing his people out of Egypt and slavery to the people, to the people of Egypt and bring them out with an outstretched arm with grace and mercy and love. And he brought them through the desert and he brought them into the promised land. And look how even though they rejected him and turned away from him time and time again, he kept showing them mercy and grace. And throughout all of Israel's history, we've seen the God who makes promises to keep them as his people and continues to show mercy and love and grace to them. That's how we know that God gives life. That's how we know that we can trust God. And all of that is absolutely true. But you and I, we live in a time and a place where we actually have, as the writer to the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, a word even made more sure a word made even more trustworthy because we have a word described to us in this way. The Apostle John, in the Gospel of John, he starts his Gospel account this way. John chapter one, verse one, he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, And his people, his own people, did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. If you want to know where to look, if you want to know whether you could trust God's word, then you need to look no further than Jesus himself. 
Because that is who John is talking about here. That Jesus is the word. That Jesus, God himself, came into this world. He is the, world made, the word made flesh and he came into this world to reveal to us who God is in a fullness we had never seen before. And he's revealed himself to the people. It says here in John 1, exactly what you see throughout history, that people like them are the same as people like us, you and me. Left to ourselves, we don't, we don't receive him. We don't look to him. We actually don't even think that he is the one that ought to light our path and be the lamp for our feet. We actually look at Jesus as maybe somebody who could be an assistant or somebody who could help us here and there, but not our God. Not this person we should be falling down before and admitting that we need to just do what he says and listen to what he says and follow him and trust him and be the one who is the center of our hearts and our lives. We so often act as if Jesus is just someone who helps us out from time to time and oftentimes we don't even pay attention to what he says to us in our lives. And yet here he is, the word made flesh who comes into this world and instead of giving us what we deserve, instead of rejecting us like we reject him, instead of turning his back on us as we turn our back on him, instead of that, he actually turns towards us in love and in mercy and grace. And he shows that he's better than anything and anyone in the whole world because he sees us and all of who we are. And yet he continues to move forward throughout his life in obedience to God all the way to obedience to death on a cross. Because Jesus is the word who spoke out from the cross, Father, forgive them. Show them mercy. And in doing so, took the very judgment that you and I deserve upon himself, exchanging his life for those who trust in him. See, the reason you can trust that Jesus is the word that Jesus is the true and better word, that Jesus is the lamp and Jesus is the light is because Jesus is the one who gives life. He gives life spiritually, taking us from being spiritually dead and in the dark to becoming spiritually alive and in the light. He is the one who gives life to physical bodies because he rose from the dead and proves that he has victory over sin and over death. And so those who trust in him will also be raised like him and will receive a resurrected body. And so we will live with him forever in our resurrected bodies in a new heavens and a new earth. That is what he promises. He is the word. And when we begin to see that Jesus is like this, when we begin to understand that Jesus is the, in a sense, ultimate word, and we begin to realize that Jesus really is better than anything and anyone else in this world. He's wiser than the wisest of all of history. He has more understanding than anybody else ever could, including you and me especially. He is sweeter and more satisfying to our hearts and our souls than anybody and anything else is because he loves us more dearly than anybody else ever will or ever could. He's the ultimate lamp for our feet and light for our path because he's not just the light of the world, but he is the light for our hearts and our souls, that he is personally leading us and guiding us and calling us to follow him wherever he leads because his way is best, his love is true. And he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that all who come to him will never perish but all who come to him will receive life and have it to the full. Which is why with the psalmist, you can have joy in your heart. And as you see Jesus for who he truly is and all of his glory and all of his power and all of his grace and all of his mercy and all of his love, you begin to be able to say, oh, how I love your law. Oh, how I love your word. Oh, how I love you, God. My savior, my king, my Lord my master, my light, my way, my life. That Jesus is all and all I need because he is better than the light, the lamp, and he is the life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
we ask that we would be people who would be able to say with growing integrity, with growing conviction in our hearts and our souls and our lives, oh, how I love your law. Oh, how I love your word. Oh, how I love you because it is your word, it's your law. Father, for those of us who are here wondering whether we really could trust your word to be true and real, that you would reveal yourself to us and you would show us that your word gives life because you give life. And Father, for those of us who maybe feel distant and cold, we know we, know we ought to be closer to you. We would long to be able to say with growing integrity, I love your law, I love your word, I love you. I pray that you would cause us to be people this coming week who do immerse ourselves in your word, who immerse ourselves in your law, We immerse ourselves in meditation upon it in singing it and praying it and reading it and listening to it and discussing it and thinking about it and memorizing it, that we would actually be people who digest and eat and experience your word in such a way that you become, as we do so, sweeter, more amazing, more delightful, more glorious, more great, that we would see you for who you truly are more clearly and that you would do that because you are gracious, because you are loving, and because as you do that in us and through us, we pray that we would obey you, we would follow you, we would trust you, we would worship you, and we would glorify you because you alone are worthy. You alone are deserving. Father, oh, how I love your law. May it be my meditation day and night. In Jesus' name, amen.